Welcome, everybody, to Talk with Mike and Tom. And today we have a very special podcast we're doing. Uh, We're including Mike, although Mike's producing, so he'll be off screen largely, but you may hear him chime in occasionally. Well, we're delighted to have Elaine Clayton. She's a noted artist and writer, and she does some other things, too. We'll be talking about those in a minute. Well, welcome, Elaine. Thank you for having me. I love it. So I'm happy to be here. So you're living in Atlanta now. You were working out of the Connecticut area and out yeah, of New York for a while. Sort of tri-state area. I was uh, in the New York City area for a very long time. Yeah. Yeah. And before that, Boston. Yeah. Little, little blip of time when I was first starting out doing children's books, I was in Boston. Yeah. And all of, mostly all of the uh, publishing industry is in you know, in New York City, so you can live anywhere, but it, it was, it really pulled me to be there more, so I just ended up gravitating to that area. So I'd love to talk about the Boston time. The first I realized, you had gone to art school, and you were starting mm-hmm. to sell paintings, and then next thing I know, you have a book in USA Today. Can you tell us how all <laughs> that happened? Well, it wasn't easy. Um, Sometimes people ask me about that, you know, when I would, okay, so in, in art school in the eighties, early eighties, I was a major in painting and drawing. And if you remember the early eighties, that would seem like the stupidest thing to major in because it was all about, you know, money and shoulder pads and big hair and get your money, you know, and, but I just wanted to do what I love. And so I was also throughout college and before that, and for many years after that, teaching children. And I decided that I was either going to do, besides just painting and drawing, fine art, I wanted to do some form of editorial art. And I was really in love with Linda Berry, some of those cartoons that, not cartoons really, but you, you might have thought of them that way, graphic novel stuff that now we see is out there, but it was really, really independent and new back in the early 80s and so I figured that I might be better doing children's books but I really kind of had both that I wanted to do and so out of teaching children I had a real passion for doing children's books and I would take my little portfolio from Atlanta where I was living um, to New York City and back then you could go to New York City with your little portfolio and believe me it was like going to Oz you know (laughs) it was pretty intimidating and uh, so you know I would meet with editors and art directors and I, I just felt like maybe you feel this way sometimes when you're in your early 20s or maybe it was starving artists kind of determination but I think at that point I would have rather died than not get published I was going to make that happen. But at the time, you know, it took a long time. Um, You know, I would sort of get the pat on the head if I told someone, I want to do children's books. You know, they would say, that's a nice dream or whatever. And uh, I would started to say, I am doing children's books. Because I was writing uh, stuff and sending it out. And I was really easily embarrassed because I remember actually getting a, I think it was Green Tiger Press in California. Um, I got a, a letter from an editor, and she had all these sort of criticisms. And I just hid in the corner and didn't do anything. <laughs> right. I only learned later that's what you want. You want the <laughs> editor right, the to, feedback. you know. So I, I had to I had a lot to learn. But the magic moment was I would always at the Paideia School in Atlanta, Georgia. It's an independent progressive school. I had a lot of freedom, a lot of creative freedom to experiment with best ways to approach education uh, with young children mainly. And before we did creative writing with, you know, six, seven year olds, we would, um, I would take that whiteboard, you know, not the chalkboard, but the whiteboard with the markers. And I would just start drawing because I had noticed that five, six year olds, when you ask them to tell, you know, to write a story. Right. They start by drawing almost every time. It's a very unusual if they don't. It's not bad if they don't, but most do. I think drawing is just a natural way for them to tell their story and to discover a story. So I would start drawing a story, and it was, you know, after lunch and the sun was coming in, and it was, you know, that kind of beautiful early afternoon. 
And um, one time, a little girl in the group said, you are not erasing this story. Because, of course, I would erase it when it was finished. And she said, you are putting this on paper. And I thought, you know what? I'm asking them to do this kind of thing. So I will also. And then I'll send it off to see if it can get published. You know, they have to go through these. They have to have teachers check their work and all that. So why don't I try that? And what ended up happening is they were probably in junior high by the time it got, it can take a few years just to get someone to look at it and then two to five years to get a picture book actually out there. So did it resonate with them at all that they'd been published? Because now they're middle school age. They're not little children anymore, right? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it meant much. I think it did because... um, you know, I, I'm in touch with some of the students right. as as adults, young adults, and they're, you know, they're still as wonderful as they were, and that's kind of magical to me, too, that they're these grown-ups now. And then I continued to do it, so I had students, um, you know, after that, too, while I was doing uh, books. So, yeah. So the book that, that gained all the attention, and you mm-hmm. were – you were in your 20s when this happened, mm-hmm. right? What, mm-hmm. It was uh, really a children's book, and it had a unique subject. It had a, a sort of a didactic approach, yeah, right? Yeah, it was Pup in School. Right? Pup, P-U-P, doggy, little doggy, uh-huh. Pup in School. Um, I, I realized by telling those stories on the whiteboard for students um, that not just students, but all of us can handle a story a, a criticism better if if an animal is at fault <laughs> right. so if you say the chicken was very rude today everyone goes yeah <laughs> but if you say you were very rude today nobody wants to hear it right. and i don't either right so i realized uh dogs you know they're cute we love dogs they're all little cute puppies kids look so cute so i just made these um characters to try to help solve some I would like to say power struggles with young children learning how to negotiate uh, passiveness, passivity, yeah. or aggression. Right. And, um, you know, I ha- so, so, yeah, the central character pup was very passive. He did not know how to assert himself at key moments. And a little doggy named Rodney Dog was very assertive to the point where he probably was a little scared at times how well it was working. Right. Um, and the publishers, you know, I think it would have been better t- as a se- selling point if I had used the word bullying, but I thought that's a label. Bu- to call someone a bully is you're also labeling right. them. It, we can have bullying behavior, yeah. but um, labels don't really help. So I didn't use the word bullying. Nothing was out there. Nothing that I know of that anyone no, ever. No, there really wasn't. There at really that time. wasn't. It just wasn't a hot topic at that time, it, as far as being in the public eye. Although right, it, it was it, happening, it, happening a lot, right. but yeah. nothing had been done. And so, I think it would have been a. It, you know, it would be probably still in print and everything today if it did have the word bullying mm-hmm. but you know what it was what it was it was a great experience it was i love the book i think uh, i know people teachers who still read it every day as a first day of school little intro right, right. for kids you yeah. know and in kids as young as two it really was for two to six year olds they will in their little cute you know plastic pants with their little yeah. jeans on to say this happened to me. You know, I mean, they will talk <laughs> right, about right. this stuff. This stuff matters. What happens to us at school or at work between people that we're relating with really has a big impact. So, yeah, that was the first one. And and you, it's unusual what you did. You you wrote it and you illustrated it. Well, so there are tons of, of artists who do write oh, their that stories. Right, yeah, too. there yeah. are. There are. Um, and I, I don't know that, honestly, that being a picture book artist was really my calling. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I think I would have needed to stay in it for much longer. Mm-hmm. After doing, I don't know how many, maybe five, Yeah. Um, a publisher at Clarion said, who knew me and knew all this other spiritual stuff right, that I love, right. she said, why don't you do a book about your real work? Right, <laughs> right. And I thought, you know what? I really should. And it, But everything has, I think of divine timing. I think there's a time for everything. And um, after she said that, and then after my kids, who were pretty young, um, 
by now, you know, by then, yeah, I was able to sort of welcome another era of taking all these sketchbook journals and dream journals that I had kept recording right. spiritual reflections and messages and drawings for since I was 18, probably yeah. 17 or 18. Um, I didn't know what all, you know, all the art was for either, all the, all this painting and stuff. I was able to finally start um, focusing on that. Yeah. So my career sort of segued a little. Yeah, you were you were getting calls to collaborate with other people and do the illustrations for their their books. I too, have. Yeah. I've illustrated for many other authors, not for picture books, but uh, for chapter books right. and uh, YA novels. Yeah. That's young adult novels. I've illustrated for Jane Smiley, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning author. Awesome, Jane Smiley. Right, right, that was, right, right. Yeah, she had a series. Um, the Georges and the Jewels, and this is about a girl. This is really a fun series about a girl who grows up in the 60s on a horse farm, and she has to get up before school and, you know, do all that work. And you know, it's just really interesting. Um, the art director knew that I loved horses and that I was a writer, so she knew I would know the equipment because that book was illustrated with ink drawings just showing the equipment so that a, a reader in, in an urban environment or someone who just, you know, doesn't know writing, if, if um, something says bridle or breastplate or harness or whatever, you, there's an illustration. So I, was, I really was in heaven doing those. So were your her. illustrations for those, you, you do all kinds of styles. So you do a, a style that looks sort of... Not cartoons, but they they're uh, have an element of caricature to them. Mm -hmm. But you also do things that are very sort of hyper realistic. And then you have the the work you're doing now, which we'll mm -hmm. get to. But uh, were those more of the realistic kind of approach, or how? That I, was I tried to make it look as real. Right. It, it wasn't realism exactly, but right. I tried. You you needed to see what the bridle right. was. It couldn't be off on that right i actually and i do love rendering so i, I did do that and that the topic about artists and styles is real interesting because i think in art school sometimes that idea i mean it's the cart before the horse it's like um you want to be yourself in some ways art school will sort of ring out your style because whatever you were doing before you end up learning a lot of things and maybe changing not always in a good way, but right. there's influence there. Right. And and then there's, um, it can almost be pretentious too, like I gotta get a style, I gotta be me and have a style. And I never really wanted to do that, I just wanted to paint and I wanted to draw and I wanted to do it however I wanted to do it whenever I wanted to do it. So I love to paint people, I love to do life studies, yeah. I love to do, I mean, you know, there are just a lot of different approaches. but. As I've gotten older, my paintings are still figurative, but I would say I've developed a sense of style by just, I guess, experience and time. Right. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know if I have a look or not, and I don't know if I care. I just want to do the work that I love. So, but I have noticed that both the abstract work and the figurative work, as far as paintings that I do, you know, not not editorial art, but the paintings that I do, you know, they're developing and they're they're telling me what they want to be. So that's kind of interesting. Well, one thing, uh, and w I'm fortunate that I have some of your art, and and I have I have from different eras. I have mm -hmm. some uh, a small piece that's a beautiful piece about a uh, communion line in a Catholic church, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. it and you can see all the different. Really, People. characters and yeah. and that and you were doing a lot of character kind line of work. work, contour yeah. drawing, line work. Yeah, I love to do that. I still do that all the time. Yeah, in the, my sketchbook. The the pieces uh, that are more recent that that I have mm -hmm. uh, and that hung in my office and in my home office are are uh, iconic size. They're first they're large mm -hmm. and second they seem to be tied with the with some of the other work you're doing now, the the spirit work mm -hmm. and the intuitive work and that kind of thing. You want mm -hmm. to talk about how you sort of morphed into these huge iconic pieces. I mean, they're, uh, when you, when for a long time you did almost miniatures. Yeah. Well, I'd still like to do that too. Yeah, you do. I, yeah. I do. Um, 
Well, I'll start by saying, so when I went to graduate school at School of Visual Arts in New York City, and it was uh, illustration as visual essay, and it was Marshall Arisman and Carl Titola, and uh, Marshall... Marshall was, he's a, he's a brilliant artist, and w one thing he noticed is that people that wanted to do editorial art, they would kind of be at the service of whatever it was that they were asked to do, mm -hmm. and then burn out after a while, running around doing whatever they're asked to do, and then driving a truck later, or whatever job, you know. So he would. He told us early on, just do what you love, and if someone asks you to do an illustration for an article in a magazine or you know, a book, um, do what you do and let it fit the the project. Find yeah. a way to make it work so that you're never not doing what you don't do. You know, don't give up what you love. Right. And so that was the best piece of advice, and you you know it because it feels feels terrible to have to draw something that doesn't feel fun to draw so um i you know i i just would over the years draw and paint what i love painting and that changes um i've always been really influenced by dreams yeah. and when i was young i was really influenced also by edgar casey who was the sort of he was called the sleeping prophet right uh so interesting and he would go into these sort of trance states and he was predicting things in the 20s and 30s, you know, that no one really paid that much attention to that we <laughs> yeah. all now know. Yeah. So, and so I would go around saying, you know, through the 80s, through the 90s, oh, there's going to be a pole shift because he would say the Earth's poles will start to go funny. And you can even go on NASA's site now yes. and just see this, you know, day glow snarl of the magnetic, uh, Right. I don't know all the scientific terms. Well, you terms, can see the changes in the light now you in, can't, in, in it, our on our property. You can you that's can really over the last 15 years you can see the changes and we remark on that. Oh, that's yeah. I haven't noticed that yeah. mm -hmm. besides seasonal yeah. changes. Um, yeah. that's that's kind of spooky. But, you know, and it and with it he said there will be extreme weather events, you know, also mm -hmm. earthquakes, you know, that ring of fire the mm -hmm. in the Pacific. Uh, going into the Mediterranean, I guess. Um, you know, there's going to be activity, and there's there will be, and people seem to me to be coming more and more polarized. Uh, and obviously, we're very polarized. Mike and I were talking about that earlier today. Yeah, yeah. it's mm -hmm. it's sad and hard to watch. Um, the the weather and nature is reflecting it, and we are reflecting it. And yeah. uh, so, about five five years ago, five or six years ago, I started painting uh, a series called Earth Changes. That's uh, the, actually the title of one of Edgar Casey's books. Um, so, you know, these paintings are about these extreme events, and, and I'm amused by some of it. It's not funny, really, but it's interesting, and there is a little bit of humor sometimes, that we grew up with certain terminology about the weather, and now it's all different. Like, now when there's a hurricane, who is in the cone of uncertainty, you know? And <laughs> right. so there's just all this, you know, stuff. And um, so I paint those things. It, my hopes are that the paintings will show us a way out, um, be honest about, you know, that the paintings will be authentic about what, what, what it feels like to be in a polarized situation. And maybe to talk more and I definitely I'm so much about the healing arts I use color and line shape and light and form and shadow to hopefully have a healing effect on people I don't want it to ignore that we're feeling anxious so the yeah. paintings have a punch mm -hmm. a little bit but mm -hmm. I don't want them to also leave us there there are areas one woman at uh, one of the shows she actually was tearful and she said she was looking at the painting this one painting, I don't remember which one it was, and she said, there's always a way out. There's always a way oh, out. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's how, yeah. It, you know, moving through the visual landscape, she could find places where there right. were openings. And, you know, and that, that meant a lot to me because you want your art to mean something to people. Right. And so yeah. that, has, that has been a really uh, enriching project i've started doing some other things uh now too though that are more i th i was doing this sort of theme of eve in the garden i i had this idea of my own midrash about uh 
dreams and yeah. you know who who would have been who who had the first dream what what human being had the first dream and i thought maybe it was eve because you know uh, with all the different ways that we can look at what that story is about, there are so many beautiful perspectives on what Adam and Eve and right. you know Genesis and how all this happened and why and, and what the story is trying to help us understand. Um, the rabbi that I really was impressed by looked at it as um, puberty. It's about puberty. At one point, mm-hmm. you weren't ashamed. You could be naked. You're running yeah. around. Little kid doesn't matter. All of a sudden, you have some responsibility. There, you are. You're a little bit embarrassed right. with your body, and there's some pain. And so sometimes that tree of life that they're standing under with the fruit is considered the tree of knowledge, also because you. It's a time to learn. Yeah. And you, we weren't that aware of that when we were younger. So that's mm-hmm. one way that I really look at it. But still, I thought um, if it was a cataclysmic sort of realization for Eve and Adam, then maybe she had a dream. And maybe the dream, she longed for paradise. Right. Just the way we do. Uh, right. Usually young adults kind of love to reminisce about oh, remember what we loved when we were seven years old and how we did this and we did that. And, you know, so I think that there, that we do do that. Yeah. And so uh, that's a lot of sort of ethereal, natural, floral kind of stuff that I'm painting. Yeah. This is Talk with Tom, Mike and Tom, and I'm Tom Hack, and I'm here with artist and author Elaine Clayton, and we're also going to be talking with her about some of the other work she's doing in the areas of healing and intuitive work. We're located downtown Columbus on First Avenue in the Rothschild Building, CMG Studios. Uh, Elaine, uh, just delighted to hear about how you came to to do those large iconic pieces mm-hmm. Also, uh, I, I know that uh, some of the other things you're doing, and all uh, incidentally, all this is on Illuminara.com. Well, it's actually ElaineClayton.com. ElaineClayton.com. That's your yeah, website. It gets so. hacked now and then, so yeah. just uh, if you find that, I, I am on it. Yeah, so just, uh, yeah. Uh, her, her website, ElaineClayton.com, and you will be able to see first the current art she is doing, and also uh, some of the other areas she's working in. Uh, wanted to talk to you a little bit about the uh, what's gotten you a lot of attention, especially as far as uh, what's gotten people interested in your writing here lately is the uh, is the work you're doing as uh, as an intuitive and a, the work you're doing as a healer. Mm-hmm. So you, you want to maybe tackle, how, how did that happen? Mm-hmm. Well, I think it started actually in childhood with dreams I had really intense dreams yeah and I won't go into any of the dreams but there was a pivotal one that was that had to do with my mom and dad and dad was kind of the protagonist or was he the antagonist anyway (laughs) he anyway it was a bad dream and I remember this is such a 1960s memory I sort of stumbled out of bed I was probably six years old I might mm-hmm. have been five years old but mm-hmm. don't think for a minute kids don't know all the themes that adults deal with because I had all of that in this dream it's not it's not like they don't get it they do get it they see and watch and feel it so I stumbled out and I was terrified to even express this dream it was such a bad one and my dad and my mom and dad were having a little cocktail party, 1960s style. And I think my dad had a turtleneck on and a blazer. Think and Ad Man. Kind of, yeah. yeah. Or and is he, it Mad Man? Yeah. I can't remember that. Yeah. yeah. And he was do- making a um, mint julep. No, it was a uh, cream de mint. It had like a f- layer of cream. I'm watching him do this in the parties over there. And he says, oh, what are you doing up? And I said, "Um, I had a bad dream. And he said, oh, what was it? What was your dream? And I said, I can't tell you. And he said, no, why? And I said, because you'll be mad at me. I'll get in trouble. And he said, no, you can't get in trouble for having a dream. Your dreams, you can't get in trouble for those. And I remember that momentous anxiety as it welled up as I finally blurted out the dream. Mm Mm-hmm. And because he was kind of the bad guy in this dream, he really laughed. He laughed. Uh-huh. But, he, but he gave me the best gift, and, and two gifts. One is he was compassionate and curious as a parent and mm-hmm. as a human being toward me. 
um, with whatever it was I was finding overwhelming. That's very important for us to not ever lose that curiosity in each other, I don't think. Um, Second of all, he let me know that you can't get in trouble for your dreams, that that is an area of you where you are learning and capable of experiencing a serious impact, actually, without it being uh, right here and now where we can get blamed for our choices. This is a different arena of human experience. Yeah. Um, and then the other point is that there's humor. You know what? It felt like the worst dream in the world, but there, actually it can be seen as funny too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's a light side to these heavy issues, and it's important to kind of re- realize that and uh, reflect on dreams and, and they don't let don't let them be so heavy. Don't let them, you know, ruin your day. But it started with that dreams that uh, every morning, sometimes at school, I would feel like the dream was still right here as I grew through high school. It would be, uh, you know, elementary school, junior high, high school dreams just were staying with me. So there was no option but to use them because they were so impressive. And at some point, I started to delve more into, into you know, how do you, how do you learn about who God is to you through your dreams? How do you be a loving person? How do you make correct choices while you uh, allow dreams to be messengers, you know, uh, sort of like that? Yeah. Um, and, but I didn't want to have the certain bad dreams that I had, so I, I started mm-hmm. to try to play with uh, flying dreams because they were the fun ones. Mm-hmm. And I learned from, you know, different things I was reading that you can, you can do that. You can create dreams you would like to have. Yeah. And I think the Iroquois tribe, they tell their kids, if you have a bad dream and someone's chasing you, you're in control of your dream. So turn around and face them and do whatever you have to do, but never run scared in your dreams. And I found that really empowering. So it started with that. And then, um, we were always kind of playing at intuition at home because yeah. we had, uh, uh, you know, there were stories about uh, people in the family who had crossed over but came back to visit mm-hmm. quickly and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, wonderful stories. Um, and so there, it just seemed like the quiet knowing that we naturally have was allowed at home. And the surprise... I like that phrase, the quiet knowing. Yeah, because we all have that, you know? Um, And if you have a place at home where you're able to freely uh, admire it, talk about it, wonder at it, marvel at it, happened just yesterday. There was somebody I hadn't thought of in months and for some random reason had thought of yesterday, just a blip of time, and I spent a few moments on it, and then I get a text from that person so these are the common ways that this stuff happens it's it's a quiet knowing where you get synchronistic events that match your thoughts for no reason that you can explain and you're saying you can you can develop that actually you can absolutely develop it you can ignore it usually to your peril though because (laughs) i mean even after all these years of practicing it and helping other people get comfortable with um seeing it as a spiritual level of uh What's the word? It's part of being a spiritual human, you know? I mean, it's sort of engagement with the world. With your soul, with your soul. It's a a way of knowing. And, um, of course, there are a lot of people that do, you know, dark arts. They say, I like to just call it the shadow arts. Mm -hmm. uh, So there's a good reason for being um, careful and, you know, stay away from all that. I don't like that. That's one of the reasons why I write books on this on the idea of spirituality and intuition is because I, people are out there doing damaging things to people. And I thought no one has to go to anyone for advice. You know, we can, you can talk to God yourself, you know, that, that is within you. Yeah. And so, um, you know, those, that's really important to develop that part of yourself rather than ignore it. But even after all these years, I'll have a feeling, oh, I shouldn't do that. Yeah, should I do that? No, I shouldn't do it. Oh, I'll do it. And then, I, and, you know, later I'm like, yep, I knew I shouldn't have done it. If you And, and we've all had that feeling where, where you go, hey, this sort of feels weird and icky. And mm-hmm. then, uh, mm-hmm. as you say, if we ignore that feeling, it, it we ignore it to our own peril, right? Yeah, you, it comes yeah. back to bite you. It yeah, always it seems does. to, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's always a... 
it's a process. We're never really there. We get as far as we do. We do well some days and not as well other days. You know, I mean, it's just that way. So, so people come to you Mm -hmm. and ask you to practice your intuitive skills with them relative Mm -hmm. to their lives. And you've done, done it through painting. You've done it through, Mm -hmm. through drawing. Talk about that a little bit, how that came to be actually a practice for you Mm -hmm. along with the healing practices. Yeah, this was interesting. So I think around 2007, I started this website at the time it was illuminara.com i just thought the word was very spiritual and i liked it and it wasn't really a word but it resonated and so i used that as the name of my business i Mm -hmm. guess or my enterprise i should say yeah and then i've changed it to elaineclayton.com more recently but i started that site dedicated to the healing arts artwork for healing and intuitive studies sort of not in an academic way necessarily at all but just in my way and I became a Reiki master which is you know um, an ancient Japanese healing art yeah Um, and it was really kind of it felt strange coming outward with this was a thing that I would do anyone who knew me knew I was into all this kind of exploration but becoming you know it wasn't really conventional at the time even just 10 years ago Mm -hmm. i think it's funny because now words like being intuitive are on tv commercials right so i'm happy i don't mind being one of the people to kind of help pull all this stuff out there because i think that we want to feel better we want to be aligned with our higher self with you know a sense of love and uh you know the world wants that and I think, so I don't regret that I started telling people, you know, I'll be intuitive with you if you want, you know. Yeah. And uh, and then there's this thing that happened. I mean, I worked with some different psychic groups um, that, that were great for me for the brief time that I was with them. And it was kind of fun because they would test you. Some actress tested me for California psychics at one point and and it, that was fun for me and she was like mm-hmm. oh you're she said you're this was wonderful you know so it was kind of validating as I stepped out to do this and then the other was uh, CT psychics um, also you know it's just real interesting to be with other people who get what this is and, and that you get a feeling you can help people but then I realized that for my own schedule with my kids and other things I needed to just um you know, be on my own. Yeah. And so a, a call was coming, and I didn't know anything about the person. I was in my studio. I was. I wanted to be really helpful to this person. I always say a prayer before I do a, a reading because the goal is to help the person. Right. Yeah. And so um, I closed my eyes, had a pencil, had my sketchbook, and I just sort of drew randomly. Yeah with my non-dominant hand and i looked at this drawing and i was i was thinking wow and i started seeing things in the drawing i couldn't believe what i was seeing and it's it's actually in the book making marks discover the art of intuitive drawing um that first drawing changed everything uh I, I should have marked that page so we could get to it but maybe i can do it later and we can we'll be able to pull it up um the so what i saw in this scribble that most people would throw away, calling mm-hmm. it a scribble or a doodle, right? Mm-hmm. Was what looked to me like a grandmother, and maybe she had some uh, IV and maybe some breathing tubes. It looked very hospitally, and mm-hmm. I'm thinking, whoa. And then um, she only had one leg, and I mm-hmm. thought, how am I going to say that to this person? That <laughs> right, is that is, so... that's sort of hard to bro- uh, yeah. broach that, right? Yeah, but what I've learned with all this is trust what comes, and you're not, you don't have to, you're not God, you don't have to be a guru, just trust what arrives, and if it has meaning for someone, that's what you want. You want it to have meaning. If it doesn't, you move on. You, there are a million ways to look at a drawing. You know that as an artist, right? Yep. So I... Um, you know, she called and I said, hey, can I just tell you I'm an artist and I was saying a prayer for you before this, uh, before you called. And can I just tell you what I saw in this drawing? I mean, I don't know if it means anything to you or not. So she said, yeah, sure, go ahead. So I actually credit her for being so open minded. Yeah, yeah. And I said, you know, um, there's this grandmother. She's in the hospital and she's got breathing tubes, but um, she only 
has one leg. And this young woman said, they did take my grandmother's leg in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no way. This was just, this was a nothing thing. Yeah. And then there was another way to look at the drawing that was important too. And I told her that that also checked out. And I thought, okay, a big thing is happening. First of all, we live in this big capitalist society where everywhere you turn, there's someone to tell you that you don't have enough and what you do have isn't valid or just buy my stuff. Okay. Your hair isn't thick enough. Your (laughs) lashes aren't long enough. You're overweight, whatever it is. It's using visual imagery to smack us hard and get us to feel like as bad as we could so we will spend our money on the thing that's supposed to save the day. Well, here I was with a drawing that was a nothing thing in some ways and super profound in another way at the service of actually strengthening someone's core rather than uh, ripping them off or even not that I mean, we all need products. I need. I needed my dress today. I right. Mean, I, yeah. Right. Yeah. Not totally knocking it, and I'm not, you know, anti-capitalism exactly. I don't think. I don't even want to yeah. get into that. I mean, <laughs> we're in it. I love it. Hey, yeah. I sell my art and books. Yeah, right. But I think that we could be more conscious of the effect and the impact of visual imagery on us, and also know that what you need in order to heal or to feel better or to have your dreams come true is not hard. It's not something you have to go get. It's not something you have to effort. It's not something you have to die for necessarily. Even like I said in my early 20s, I would have rather died than get published. I had to go make it happen. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't necessarily have to do things that way. Yeah. But I at that time thought I did. And maybe maybe at times we need to learn how to do boot camp. But at the same time, I think that we can use very simple methods to actually give each other a lot of support and to change our lives. It's not hard. So you you, you receive quite a bit of interest for with making marks, and I know mm-hmm. uh, uh, there there are a lot of people interested in that whole idea of art being a, a two, and maybe even a three way street where you have all these different things happening communication wise. Mm-hmm. You're working on a new project, and it uh, it's sort of a book series, uh, a little bit of angels, a little bit of well, fairies. Well, actually, yes. Um, this is with Sterling, and it's a beautiful little series. I'm not the only author in this series. There are all, all these wonderful authors. So this series is called A Little Bit Of, and the first one I did was A Little Bit of Angels. I absolutely was in total heaven making that book. Um couldn't have been happier. And then I was so lucky they asked me to do, would you do a little bit of fairies too? And I said, yes, <laughs> Yeah, I will. right. And so that was really interesting because on the one hand, we have angels and we have this rich uh, Judeo-Christian history in the Western world. I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable about all the different uh, places in, on earth that have a concept of angels, but very rich, beautiful uh, history to draw from. And then our own personal experiences and stories and thoughts and, you know, um, ideas about what angels are. And then you have fairies. And so, and sometimes there seems to be a very, um, almost a power struggle with uh, pagan, you know, the idea of uh, notions of of there being elves and fairies and sprites and stuff like that in the natural world, probably because the natural world is a little scary. It does stuff we can't control. Yeah. Uh, so, but yet God created it. So it's not a fairy isn't going to be exactly like an angel, but a fairy has her job. So when you look at a flower, you see a beautiful flower, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Imagine being the carer of the life source that fills that flower. You only know a, f- a flower only knows to bloom and be beautiful. It knows no other. And then it does fade and die, but in its peak, it knows only to be beautiful, right? So I discovered through my own meditations and dreams that that is what the fairies are like. And you know, when you watch, well, you do yard work, right? Mm -hmm. You you know, that vine's trying to strangle that one, trying to do that tree in, trying to do, oops, sorry, that tree in. And uh, you know, I realized, yeah, because whoever, the spirit of life that is in, that vine, every little atom of it, is going to fight for it to live. 
just like we're supposed to live strong too you know and uh was that from the talmud every blade of grass has an angel whispering grow grow Mm -hmm. everything out there is is burgeoning with that beautiful life source yeah i think from god that's how i see it it is it is creation happening creation didn't happen and now we're just dealing with it it is constantly happening so there are spirits within nature that uh you know they're out there now would i go out and say start playing with elves i really wouldn't because i think from dreams i've had they're a scrappy bunch i really wouldn't do that um i nor would i um i guess think that you know i can get fairies to do my bidding for me or something like that i don't i don't know about any of that i just enjoy that nature has its job there is a spiritual essence in everything alive out there yeah yeah. Well, th- this series has been very well received, and I know you're you're getting a lot of interest with that. Uh, I'm with uh, Elaine Clayton. Her website, elaineclayton.com, where you can see her art, you can see her books, you can see what we're going to talk about in this final segment, which is the the card she's doing, and they're, they're cards she's developed that feature her art and also her creative ideas. You want to talk a little bit about those? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, um, you know, when I was doing the, um, actually before what, you know, the drawing that I said that I used that turned out to be really meaningful to the client that I had on the phone, uh, that that was very intuitive, and all it was was a two-second thing. That, at that same era of time, again, I was realizing the impact that visual imagery has on us. Now, this isn't new to me. I've thought it for as long as I can remember, especially doing art you think a lot professionally as an artist you're going to have to be responsible as as much as you can about how your imagery might affect people Uh, you can't control that but you have to be responsible for what you're trying to say at least and um, then let it go do what it does but um, my personal philosophy for all these years as an as an adult has been that we're really affected by visual stimuli i think you know we don't get a chance to process how this stuff affects us though wherever we go we're highly visual and and we don't we just move through the day we're busy we don't have time to think you know how did that brick wall affect me but actually most things do have an impact so Mm -hmm. i decided i would take um images from a lot of art that i've done over the years and just create a deck of cards and they're large in this first book on intuition uh, it's called Illuminara Intuitive Journal. So I also love it for people to journal because then you're having a conversation. You're going to that quiet place. Um, you could just be complaining when you do your journaling, but maybe it needs to get out. And then after you do it for a while, you start actually asking questions and you start allowing answers and it can be interesting. Um, so Illuminara Intuitive Journal with these large image cards is designed so that you turn a card over, maybe you do them at random, you just pick one at random, and then you look at the imagery and you actually spend a few moments thinking about how it impacts you. Um, does it remind you of anything? We have really strong memories and we have really strong associations the way our brains, you know, group things together and you know for us to understand things and and it's we're very unique so we have uh, what Jung called the collective unconscious and we have the personal so if i said to you let's say we were we had one of those cards in front of us and you you had a picture of an apple we would agree that we uh know what an apple is you know what an apple is i know what an apple is but if i asked you to write about your impressions, memories, feelings, anything, even random things that don't really make sense, but they come to mind. If you were to write all that stuff down in the journal, you would then be able to share with me, and it would be very different from yeah. my first memory of an apple. Like, can, do you have any childhood memories of an apple? Oh, sure, yeah. Name one. Just uh, name one. Well, I, I can remember uh, bobbing for apples in South America. Okay, now that's cool, because yeah. my early memory 
is also bobbing for apples in Texas. Wow. And, the, That's and funny. I didn't expect you to bob like Isn't I that was. funny, yeah. Yeah, and it hurt my teeth. I didn't like yeah. I'm sticking my face and in this cold water. And icky. Other people have been in it. And I, all what this, were the moms thinking? Yeah, right. You know, it yeah. was supposed to be a yeah. fun party. My tooth hurts. Ugh. Yeah, I wasn't digging it. Yeah. <laughs> So, but you're, see, I could spend a long time talking to you. Well, tell me about South America. What kind of apples do they have there? I mean, we start going places. That's right. The important part of it is is uh, you being able to enjoy your own experience with whatever had an influence on you, and in this case, an apple in South America, and then me being able to share that with you. And then when you... Allow me to hear about your memory and your impression of what an apple means. I'm actually valuing you. That sounds like a, a great way to get in touch with yourself and your own feelings and how you construct meaning about Absolutely events and all it kinds is. of things. Absolutely. I, I, I'm thinking, and with others and to appreciate others. Yeah, I, if you if you do it, say, in a group, you learn mm-hmm. a lot about each other. What a great— Yeah, or you just one-on-one. One-on-one, you know, on one, one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, so that was the first um, book using visual imagery to access yeah. intuitive um, knowing and uh, then the making marks. And I call that stream drawing. Yep. Uh, we I don't call it doodling. I think doodle is a non-word. It sounds silly. Mm-hmm. This profound thing is kind of happening. Okay, it might let you draw freely because it's a non-word so that when you're on the phone, you can do it and not, there's no pressure on you. That part's beautiful about it. Yeah. The ugly part is when you throw that thing away or you don't value it because no one valued your marks. So I think, you know what? That's People need to make marks. It's a very yeah. natural, innate instinct. The cavemen did it. Cave women too, I'm sure. Uh, and we need to do it. Babies do it. Mm-hmm. It's not something we should stop yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, and actually, we should value it and find ways. So, I call it stream drawing because you're kind of entering the unconscious, and it's like the stream of unconsciousness flow that comes easily when we dream because we can't help it. It's just happening. Um, but you can allow that same flow to actually actually to be aware of it. I think it's never really gone. It's right here, right? But you can make space and time to be aware of it, and you will be more conscious of why you do things. Why did right. you get in that relationship? Yeah. Why did you uh, choose that job you hate? Mm-hmm. Or why did you? Uh, why do you want a, a different thing to do with your time or whatever? You know, you get to the root of things, and it and it really helps make um, choices that you feel more aligned and happy about. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And so, you can forgive people because you can actually explore ha- all the stuff you learned, and then you know be thankful for some of the hardest things even. But you then own your own responsibility for. Some of the reasons why you unconsciously let this or that happen. Right. It allows us to think about how we construct meaning from these events, too. Yeah, we uh, need A lot to. of it has to, has to do with how you construct meaning and what meaning you construct. Absolutely. I think yeah. it's about meaning. I think yeah. it is about, it's about what do things mean to me. How do I feel in awe of the world and not then know what things mean to me? It kind of goes hand in hand. Well, there are so many projects that you're working on and have been working on and you and you're creative in so many areas it's uh, unusual to to talk with someone who does this many different things usually folks have an area where they're really uh really strong but you 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 have these multiple talents so i guess my question Thank would be you. <laughs> you've recently made a transition to georgia from mm-hmm. connecticut mm-hmm. What's next for you now in the d- working out of the Atlanta area, Atlanta, yeah. Georgia? It's fun to there. come home. I yeah. think of the South as home in so many ways. Yeah, um, yeah that was an interesting thing because it was the, ch- the children flew the nest, the birds flew the <laughs> nest, you know. And so I thought, well, how do I do this next era and um, without sort of – slumping into despair because my kids aren't there right right that was mm-hmm. that's a big deal to raise two kids and then all of a sudden you really have a different pattern you know a, another door is opening and so I thought what is it I would want what would my 
ideal be and wherever we ever moved I always had a studio whether it's in a corner somewhere or a room or in the barn or whatever it was Mm -hmm. there was a studio and um, I'm real grateful for that and uh, I thought you know I just want to live in my studio I want to get up I don't want to have to go somewhere I want to get up and it's right there Uh, if I want to do some artwork before I go to sleep it's right there so um, this just kind of fell into place. Like this is part of that stream of consciousness flow. When something is effortless and it's attached to something you feel drawn to, yeah. that you have a lot of uh, good feeling about, positive feeling about, it doesn't hurt to just allow that flow. You know, it's like they say, don't ever try to row up river, yeah. upstream. You know, because you can't. It's just not gonna. You're not. You're gonna be tired, and it's, you're gonna be weary, and it's not gonna work. So I just sort of put my boat in, and all these doors open totally easily. Yeah, sure, come here. We have a place available. There's never a place available at this one place, and hardly. Uh-huh. And I, so I was like, hmm, this is very interesting. Yeah. And the people are nice. They're not saying hurry up and decide or anything. There was nothing aggressive. Right. And so I got myself to Atlanta, and Georgia has a real soothing love vibe if you ask me Mm -hmm. i know i i give credit to martin luther king doctor reverend dr martin luther king jr because Mm -hmm. i think that he put an umbrella of love Mm -hmm. over the city of atlanta and Mm -hmm. the state of georgia has a quality about it there there's also a lot of hard history and all that too so there's layers but um I am soothed by it, uh, even though we've had no rain this summer, uh, maybe once. Right. Uh, so um, we're sort of in a big drought, but it's it's still, to me, almost subtropical. The, mm-hmm. the uh, crepe myrtles stay in bloom all the time. Right. You know, you yeah. might wear flip-flops in December and all that. Yeah, so I'm in there and uh, just being soothed for this point in time. I don't really know what's next, but I am doing the work I love, and that matters. I'm not so sure how smart it is to have so many irons in the fire, but I do I do love writing. Uh, I do love, of course, painting, and um, I do love helping people. Yep. So it's so doing those are your three things. Pretty much yeah. the healing arts, uh, visual, fine art, yep. and. Uh, and you know writing it, it's cyclical um the thing that never goes away is help you know the the intuitive stuff um with with clients yes. and um doing visual artwork almost never wanes but writing kind of comes and goes so again i go with the flow i try not to force anything it's really hard to get a book out usually though yeah yeah oh it's it's like you know it's like anything good it, you got to suffer a little so it's not only blissful there's some you know but when you love what you're doing and you and you love what you have to say or you believe in it and you think the world will be a little bit better for you know i'm not trying to say i have an ego and i have the answer but i mean in our way we have this one chance right now to give the world the best that we can give and through this work that's what i feel like i'm doing I'm trying to do that. And there are countless ways in which I could be way better. One of the most important things is taking this um, stream drawing stuff to um, people to do, you know, in small groups and large groups. I was at a a place for um, kids at risk, you know, young adults actually at risk, uh, uh, maybe a month ago, Covenant House. and Right, um, right, yeah. This room of gorgeous young adults, who knows what hardships they've faced, Mm -hmm. they got it immediately. They could close their eyes, draw with their non-dominant hand, make a drawing, not even questioning, go in, do stuff with it, see things in it, have conversations about what those things meant. I was completely blown away. Um, You realize when you have the idea that you might help people, really they may be helping you because these people, as young as they were, were so composed and so creative and so empathic, like natural empathy just coming out of them. But I like doing those kinds of things. I've done workshops with kids and adults my whole career, especially as a visiting author in schools and things like that but i i my idea is uh you know taking the stuff that, whatever it is uh, that i'm doing and using it with um groups and individuals back so. in atlanta georgia where your career began 
So yeah, these I'll do things. it anywhere. I do yeah. it. I I'd still go anywhere to do those yeah. things. Though. But yeah, at, right now home base is Atlanta. So yeah. Well, I'm here with uh, Elaine Clayton. I want to thank you. Her uh, website, ElaineClayton.com, where you can see all about her work and get in touch with Elaine too. She she will uh, respond to your inquiries <laughs> and. Uh, I, I sure enjoyed talking with you, Thank and uh, you. and it was good catching up because yeah. uh, uh, as as long as I followed your career, I, I still kind of lost track of some of the things you're doing right now. So uh, well, thank you for being here with you. with me and Mike Baltimore, who thank you so uh, much is, for having me. Uh, Mike's uh, doing the producing today. Thank you, Mike, for doing the producing. Oh, I you're think very this welcome. Is, you guys did a great job. Yeah. Uh, it's a very interesting podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank Elaine. you again. <laughs>